Hello, everybody. So there is no schedule, or rather, there's no, I, there's no program for for this. Um, we are here to answer your questions, whatever they are, and hopefully try and help you through some issues if you're having them. Um, so if that's the case, please unmute yourself and show us when ask. It'll be awfully quiet if no one asks any questions. Seems pretty quiet. I will type something in the chat. Height ambiguity. What would you like to ask about the height ambiguity? And how how about asking it with word with your voice? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your time. So sorry being pain and asked about this topic, but I'm, I'm just following that notebook and um could I ask just a quick guideline for the equations to get to that sensitivity, which then will be just, you know, two pi divided by that sensitivity. But how from the equations that we have in the notebook, I can get uh, to that equation? Um, well, I think you want to know what the what if you want to substitute in a phase shift of two pi right that the the concept of a the height ambiguity is that you that's the that's the height change that gives you a phase change of two pi so if you substitute in two pi for the phase change and rearrange it so that it's in so that this you, you get what H is in terms of all the other things. I mean, more than that, I would actually have to do the math. And I'm... <laughs> um, but it, does that not, does that not work? I haven't actually got the notebook open. So I'm going to open it. It's following the notebook. And... I think also there's a mistake in the notebook and uh, one of the equations in that the interferometric triangle for the Z, isn't it? Uh, do you want to open, do you want to share your screen and show us what you're, what you're looking at? Because okay. I think you can. Did anyone have any? Okay, this is my screen? Yeah. Oh, nice. Because so here I think that should be minus here, but we have like a quill. I just changed this, so isn't it? Yeah. So this is this is my version. Maybe. Yeah, let me find this one three. Yeah, that looks. Like yeah, so this is the original one. Okay, no, well, I changed, okay, I changed it, the original, sorry. That was, there was, uh, that was a mistake here. So then for the equation, the final, that ambiguity. Oh, I just so, have, I have an equals, yeah. Yeah, that, that, yeah, right. that needs to be changed. <laughs> okay, so, so this is the answer, yes, because it just is two pi divided by, uh, but the difference in phase, but the difference in, in height, yes. So to get to this equation, which exactly for those I should follow? Uh, uh... You know, there are like a lot of topics thrown here in an equation and suddenly, yeah. Got it. Um, I think so the flattened phase, that delta phi flat, 
equals. Okay. So do you have the no this notebook open so I can stop sharing? I don't want to like everyone like go back and forth. I there's no problem with you keeping your, your screen showing. Um all right. And fellow instructors, please feel free to join in here. Here we go. Consult my own notes. Yeah. I'm on the call here. I feel like this would be a great question for Paul or Anne. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe uh, some, maybe people have some other questions, so I don't want to take so much time on this. But at some point, if that can be added to their notebook, that might be great. I would appreciate this and I don't want to, you know, take your time because I bet there's many people having their own questions. Mm. In my experience, lots of people can show up just to watch. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, well. <laughs> and until they until they actually say something. Uh So, Garrett, uh, is this question answered during the during the lecture? Because there are like there are like a couple of answers to it. I think the equation should be transformer to apply. I think Rowena answered the question, and yeah, okay, we have it in the in the chat too. I feel like I have the. I have the derivation in my PhD thesis, but I haven't read it in so long. <laughs> it's kind of dropped out of my head. Yeah, it's, it's just what would be the satellite byte. This is the what we go into this equation on the in the chat. I have this. Uh, this and then you need a perpendicular baseline. Yep. Well, I I know I've seen that equation. I've found I found the different. I mean. Differently describe those equations. I'm just following the notebook. So, um, yeah, using the equations in the notebook, I would like to get to that equation. Um, because the notebook should follow like some theory, isn't it? Step by step, so we get to there. It's not like I have to, but yeah, I, I've seen that link as well. Thank you for putting in the chat. Uh... It's it's just the uh, the symbols are a little bit different from this equation there, but more or less it's the same thing. Please contribute to topography. In terms of that. Um... That notebook 1.4, there were so many problems to get the uh, NetRack uh, username and password name. And so many people had that issue. The, the problem was with the code itself, reading from the text. Um, so the change in the code helped. Even the NetRC file is not visible for us. We cannot see it on the list. It, it's out there. Because I had the file and it was giving me the error, like for the, everyone at the beginning, and they just need to change the code for reading different location from the from the loaded file, and everything worked. So that was, I think, the problem. 
Yeah, I so on, on my setup, I I just have a NetRC file, um, and you see, I didn't enter anything here, uh, and I ran it, and you know, the download happened. I ran it again, and it told me that, it, that I'd already downloaded the data, um, and when it came to the dem download, which is the other place where you need it, um, the verify dem step, it also yeah just worked. So I here it is. No. Um, so maybe the file was specifying wrongly. Uh, well, it's all the core command. Where you set the file up in the first place. So like, you know, like all all my file is and. You can see it here. Basically, I I made a fake version of my my NetRC file. Um, just three lines. Your NASA.gov, Your login with your login name, and then your password with your password. And if you have it set up like that, it should work without any extra anything. Um, well, I I think you do have to change the permissions on it. Uh, I, I did that. <laughs> That's easy too, right? Six, yeah, mod 600 slash dot net rc fake. Done. Um, so if you're comfortable at all with the terminal, this is the easiest way, I think. But there are other ways, of course. And what the way I did it, uh, for any anybody watching, anybody who wants to edit it manually, you can use Emacs, which is like a one of that's like an ancient text editor program that is basically found on all old style terminals. So I did Emacs oops, till the slash dot net RC. And in this case, I'll, I'll show you my fake one, not the real one, because because, but anyway, so you can type in whatever you like here. So you know, another fake password like that. Uh, to exit, you hit Control X, Control C, and it asks you if you want to save the file. You say yes, and now you have edited your file. So if anyone is watching and is having trouble, try that uh, and see if it works. Um, when it comes to downloading Sentinel data, which we will do tomorrow, um, there is an additional step that you might need to take if, when it comes to actually the download command, and that is that you have to uh, accept the terms and conditions for, for Sentinel-1. Um, in the in the strip map app notebook, you'll see sometimes when you're trying to download files that it, that it comes up with like a... Um, if I was to run uh, here. Um, if I was to run this command, which I'm not gonna, I guess it's not gonna work so well. Uh, you end up with a, a, a link that you can click, a clickable wget link. It makes a URL based on you know this stuff, embeds your password and everything in it. Um, similarly. If you click on that link, it will it will you will try and down it will try and download the computer uh, the file to your local machine. But if you don't have permission, it will send you back to the NASA website, and um, you will have to like click some more like agreements to actually accept terms and conditions, and then you can download the file. And if you've done that, then the the download links will work when you when you actually do it for real and in the um in the notebook, which we'll do tomorrow. Tops app. Anyway, um, I don't think I need to share this anymore. Anybody else have anything? Yeah, Eric worked on a, a fix to the notebook. So might make it more functional. We've been unable to actually accept changes yet, um, but we'll try and get that done by tomorrow. Megan. 
Hello, Gareth. Thank you. I just have a question. I will share my screen just to show what I'm referring to. It relates to the geophysical modeling part that uh, Franz explained this, I guess, your morning. Um, so here, um, it actually like a huge, it ended up having like 1000 times iteration. Um, but my question is that, um, what's the best approach to define this change range? Is that like randomly selected or should we follow specific approach? Um, yeah, that's the trick, right? So with the, the grid search is that you have to give it limits and step sizes. Um, and it requires a bit of your geophysical experience um, mm -hmm. and your knowledge about an event. In this case, uh, what you could do is because you have the old numbers and, and those were pretty close. So you could use the the Z value and sort of the middle of your range, uh, the old, you know, the 2.58 and the volume as sort of the middle of your range. And then and then search around around those um, to find the optimum. And uh, in this case, there isn't any huge surprises in terms of the shape of the, I mean, the, 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 um, uh, misfit function is is still smooth, so you you can start with a bit of a coarser step size uh, initially to sort of get your range right, and then um, um, sort of use a smaller step size to get the the shape of the misfit function estimated a bit better. So you probably overdid it a bit. Let me see here. Uh, in the volume range, uh, zero point zero one. So you probably missed the volume because your volume is actually much larger than the one that we had originally. The minimum, mm -hmm. yeah. You're sort of by an order of magnitude off, right? So we it, we originally had 0 0.003. Mm -hmm. and you're searching from 0 0.01 to 0 0.06. So you're searching much larger volumes. Yeah. Um, so I would center it more sort of on the 0 0.003 um, with a, a bit of a smaller step size than you currently have. Um, and yeah, so you're probably off by a factor of 10 with the volume. Yep. And you're also off with the Z because you're searching shallower than what the true depth is. Mm -hmm. And you can see that if you, do you have the misfit function plotted? Yes, it's yeah. kind of uh, here. Yeah, so you see when whenever you have your best fit on the corner of your misfit space, it means that you most likely missed the um, the minimum. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yes. So whenever you end up at an edge of a search space, that's usually not necessarily a good sign. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Gareth, I may have spoken over you. <laughs> it's okay. You suddenly just sprung into life. Oh, I was, I was there. I was listening. I heard my name. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm glad. So, um, yeah, you can you can over, you, it, in the end it doesn't matter if you want to do a, a thousand iterations. That's fine. Uh, once you once you sent it very nicely, I had a a student once who like, you know, estimated the most smooth misfit function by doing tiny step sizes. If you have that time, that's okay. But it's probably it's not needed. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Do a very much sort of a very coarse first search. Yeah. Um, bracketing so big big. Bit of values and then I I I I find when I find which pair of values bracket the the best answer right I then sample again between those two at a at a finer scale. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so that's a problem for both. You know, if you do grid search, that's a problem. You need to give it an ex expected range. But even if you do non-linearly squares uh, inversion, you need to give it starting um, starting values for that. And uh, there is. Um, trickiness evolved, especially if your solution space is has sort of local minima. You have to make sure that you're actually finding the global minimum in your in your solution space. It's not always easy. Any other questions? Uh, 
but if you if you have a a nice solution by tomorrow, it might be uh, kind of cool to show that off. Um, and uh, we can discuss the misfit function. It's it's actually quite interesting once you look at that in contrast to the one that we've had earlier today. Um, you see that the shape of it is going to be different. And we can talk about that. So our job is to is to is to hold this very awkward silence until someone says something. Any good books or review papers or some guidelines to catch up with the theory? <laughs> There are some, yeah. So the review, there's a good review paper from the 90s by Matinee and Feigl. That's a good one. There's one that Eric was a co-author on, or maybe more than one. Um, Can we get some some document with some references? Unless it's something out there across those notebooks, but there's so many of them, I didn't get through all of them. Are you looking it, at it a... It doesn't have to be one. today, but at some point... I, let me do some Googling. <laughs> If Are I you can... looking for a review on INSAR or for modeling or which one? Well, in general, to catch up with the theory, because I'm doing mostly optical things, mm -hmm. um, some basic SAR, but the INSAR is... Uh... Well, let me know if you can get to see these links. The, the one I've just posted is Massonet and Feigl, 1998, which is kind of a, what I read when I was a graduate student. That was kind of the only thing available at that time. Uh, there's an annual reviews paper by Bergman et al. Let me see, let me find that. 1000. Did anybody read the uh, um, Alberto Moreira's Synthetic Aperture Radar one in IEEE magazine? It's a pretty nice one. There's a one by Paul Rosen, which is good too. Which is basically how the old Roypack software worked and describing it. Um, yeah, the Morera one is is more recent. It's nicely illustrated. It yeah. it talks you through the SAR image formation. It also talks about INSAR polarimetry. I'm gonna put a link in chat. There's the book by Ramon Hansen. Yeah, I I like that one. Yeah, I have that on my desk. <laughs> I don't know if that's still in print, though. I have seen this. Reviewing a book proposal by somebody. <laughs> I did so a that's... review for Springer, and I was like, oh, I'll have that. <laughs> yeah, so it's called Radar Interferometry. It sort of approaches INSAR a bit more from a geodesy perspective. I like that, and it has a good uh, description of the error model of INSAR. So the, yeah. the link I've just posted in, in the chat is not for the book, but it's to Paul Rosen's review paper, which is probably the closest thing to the notebook in terms of what the the, the version of the theory that, that Paul espouses, which of course is what's in that notebook. It's grappentine.org. Yes, <laughs> that's one of Franz's colleagues. <laughs> He's yeah. pirating, yeah, copyrighted papers. Very nice. The IEEE, yeah. Well, I think it's expensive to join the IEEE. Uh, and the book. Let's find the book. Hansen. Garrett, I already put the title. Uh, okay, I found the link, but it costs one hundred eighty nine dollars. It's expensive. Which one? Uh, Ramon one. Oh, here's the Springer. Yep. 
So there is for Ramon's book, if you go to eight books, I think there are cheap copies available. I think somebody in India created a PDF once and selling is selling like cheap, cheap copies of Ramon's book. Um, Maybe ask him. Yeah, I'm sure he doesn't like, mind. Like eight books, you find uh, affordable versions. Yeah, the ebook is one hundred eighty nine dollars, and then the hardcover book is two hundred and fifty. Oh, and if you are, if you're more like if you are interested more, if you don't want to necessarily go too deep into sort of the signal processing aspects of SAR, um, but more you know the applications, there's the book by Woodhouse that I like uh, is sort of a, an entry level book on SAR. More about SAR than INSAR, though, right? It's more about SAR than INSAR. Um, that is that sometimes he said he gives it away for free, right? Yeah, he does give it. Yes, and the ebook there is sometimes avail available for free, and even if it's not free, it's usually quite affordable. You just have to follow him on Twitter, and like at the start of the school year when he's teaching yeah. his course. Yeah, so he's yeah, Aaron put the name in it, and the link, the Amazon link, is the. And right now, the Kindle book is free. Again, not super in SAR heavy, but more if you're more interested in the scattering properties and the polarimetry of SAR, it's a nice uh, way to get used to that. Yeah. I have it on my Kindle. <laughs> yeah, I do too. <laughs> like reading. <laughs> There's a question. Well, okay, Ritka, you don't have a file. That's why it's not not working. Yep. There's no file there to 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 look at. Also, you have to put. Well, yeah, okay, you put a space in eventually. But at, right, so if you ran Emacs on that that same file name, the tilde slash dot net rc, then it will open up a, a text editor that you can actually edit, make and edit the file. And then you have to put the three the three rows of information in the the, the server name, your login name, and your um, password. Let us know if you need more more details. Does that explanation make sense? Fair light. I just checked eight books. And Ramon Hansen's book goes from anything between 150 bucks to 426 dollars. So maybe not. I wonder who wants to sell this book for 100, 426 bucks. I'd be amazed if they sold any. Uh, some kind of craziness about uh, used books. Sometimes, if there's just a few available, they just the prices go crazy. Yeah, I, I reviewed a book proposal for Springer and they gave me a two hundred dollar credit in their in their store. So I was like well, at the time that was enough to pay for the book. So I got the book. That's the way. <laughs> Clearly. Otherwise before that I had to go get it from the library. Okay, there's another screenshot. Right, you have an empty, you have an open uh, Emacs. Okay. So, yes, you have to type the things in now. Can you remember what the first line is? Anybody? Machine, is it? Uh, where is it? Not that one. Too many windows open. Yeah. I just put it in the chat. Yeah. Okay. So that's the first line you have to type in or copy in. You have to type it in.
Yep. So if you use uh, copy uh, Zach's chat message is the first line. Not really copy it. You have to type it in. Oh, you can copy paste from the chat. Well, you, actually, you probably can, but you have to paste with like Control V and all. Yeah, you have to do Control Yeah. Another star book that I really like. I'm not sure if anybody has this one. Oh. Eric, do you have that? I wish. Ian Cummins. Uh, sorry. Uh, I think uh, I might have a an older version. It's a bit, it's very focused on SAR, not, not on inside at all, but it's it sort of, if you're interested in various processing algorithms and, and sort of a more systems theory notation of, of SAR, that's a really nice book to have. Once you've typed all the things in, you hit Control X and then Control C, and you get a question Do you want to save the file? You say yes. And it will write you a file. So what you haven't typed in the rest of your file. Where's the where's your login name and where's your password? You would probably if you wanted to share your screen, we could we could guide you through this a bit faster. Yeah, if you share your screen, we might be able to help you a bit more efficiently. And you can also unmute yourself if you can. I'm not sure if your microphone allows that. All right, so can you see further up in the chat where people have typed in uh, login is the next thing. You have to type login next. Right, and then your login name. Is that the one you're registered with um, Earth Data with? Yes. Okay, cool. And then you can type your password. The, firstly, the word password, and then you would then you would type in what your password is, and it, maybe at that point you want to unshare your screen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You may want to unshare before you actually type your password. <laughs> and once you have your password there, you can hit Control X, Control C, and something should come up at the bottom that says. You know, do you want to save this file? And you hit Y for yes, and it will save the file. Uh, you, there's one more step that you can take to pr protect your yourself when you get back into the um, terminal. You can type basically that and run it, and that will basically set permissions for your file that um, 
other people can't see it. Yeah, some versions of the script will check that permissions and not accept it if it's not correct. So with all of those things, you should have a functioning netrc file. Um, Anybody else? Any other questions? I have a question if we're just hanging out for a second. Go ahead. Um, so I was running a SAR processor, the 0 0.9, just kind of looking through that. And towards the end, when we get to the azimuth focusing after we've done the range compression, they keep talking about either a constant reference function or a range varying reference function. And I didn't quite understand what that function was. Like, I understand that we're going to be using the Doppler shift to like say where that echo is coming from in azimuth, but I didn't quite understand how the reference function, like what that was, how that was getting us there. Yeah, basically in azimuth, we are uh, trying to replicate. So when, when you sort of fly by a target at a certain distance, uh, you uh, collect sort of a, a phase function that either, depending on what explanation you like, it's either, you know, you can calculate from the Doppler uh, effect. Uh, so you have a, a basically a frequency shift um, related to Doppler. And the frequency shift depends on the relative velocity between um, your your satellite in orbit and the point on ground. And that changes depending yep. on distance. And so uh, I like better the explanation of the range, uh, and it also is more directly what we're measuring is the variation of range as the satellite flies by. Mm, okay. And uh, and what this and you get basically a range parabola. It's actually a range hyperbola. Uh, so the range function acts like a hyperbola, and the uh, the curvature of that hyperbola is different in near range than it is in far range. And so what the that reference function that is does is try to replicate that range hyperbola so you can remove the the phase signature from uh from the from the observation and then collapse your initially smeared out response into a single point and uh, in theory you have to update that at every range because because with every range line this function is changing usually what we do is we do it in blocks because over a certain number of ranges the difference in the hyperbola is so small that it doesn't matter uh, so in the first time in the notebook, it's processed. We use basically the center of the scene as the, and, and use mm -hmm. a, a constant um, shape of that hyperbola. And that leads to inefficiencies and op on suboptimal focusing on the edges of the image. And the second time there, it's it's updated um, for certain range blocks uh, and, and provides more optimal performance this way. Um, so and... yeah, so that makes sense. Like I can, I can picture like the the range parabola of like a you know a corner reflector when it's unfocused. I guess I'm a little unsure on like, um, you know, you have this echo. It has this sine wave or you know a complex if you've done the the transform. How you like? What is that? What are you actually correlating with? Is it? Yeah, like what? Like what is the range function or this reference function actually? Yeah, it's it's basically a chirp, right? So it's it's a it's a linear it's oh, okay. the linear quadratic chirp function uh, that sort of replicates uh, that phase history, and um, and so if you have if you have a, a signal and and you have a quadratic phase uh, going through that signal, it it, it sort of smears out uh, the impulse response. And in order to bring it back together, you have to remove that that quadratic phase term, and so we do that by okay. multiplying. Um, the observed data with the with the inverse of the uh, of the phase signature that's on top of it. So we simulate that that chirp 
uh, signal that's that's uh, in the phase and then then remove it through a match filtering process. Um, and so there's usually there's a there's a quadratic component to it which which smears out the data set so that causes your impulse response to be smeared out across the uh, length of the aperture. And then sometimes mm -hmm. you also have a linear trend through it. That's basically your Doppler, your zero Doppler phase. And so if that zero Doppler is zero, then um, your object appears right at um, bore side, basically orthogonal to your flight path. If you are sort of squinted, then you have a, a yeah, positive okay. Doppler and that shifts. So that the linear phase shifts point targets around. Uh, and the quadratic phase uh, smears the point target apart. So you remove the quadratic phase to focus the image uh, using a matched filtering process. And you have to replicate that quadratic phase. If you do that right, all the, all the quadratic signature goes down, everything collapses to a point. If you're missing some because you're using a slightly wrong reference function, then the a residual smear, residual defocus uh, remains. And so you want to update the reference function as much as you can to optimize for a specific range. And so if we're not squinted, we wouldn't have any linear uh, element. It would just be quadratic if, if it's not yeah, squinted. If it's not squinted, then the center of the, um, the, the frequency at the center is zero uh, if you're not squinted. And if you're squinted, then it's not zero. So last I'll let you. And I think there's three iterations. There's like, Azimuth uh, focusing time domain with a constant reference function, azimuth focusing with a varying reference function. And I think then there is a frequency-based azimuth focusing with a varying reference function, yeah. Uh, Celeste, you had your hand up. <laughs> yeah, I had a question, sorry. Um, I'm gonna just share a screen. I think that'll be, is that okay? Sure. Um, so this was on 1.2 and I was just trying to, um, make the adjustments for the depth and the volume. And I think I might've figured out where my, so this is what I'm getting here. And I'm wondering if it's just a matter of on my volume, I'm doing it to two decimal points. I'm sorry, I was just looking at it and I realized that's probably why it's saying zero. Uh, yeah, can you scroll yeah. up? Oh, yeah, uh, it, it, yes, your, your, your print statement where it says V equals percent 5.2 F. Do you see that in, uh, yes. yeah, if you do 5.4 or something or uh, then uh, and r run this again, you're basically cutting off your float uh, at, Oh, it still does it. Why is it the still line above <laughs> the print statement above? Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you, know, you, you do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Well, your mouse is now. Yes. Okay. So, go ahead and make that a four. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, yeah. Yeah. And do it again. Sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you. Um, see if it does it now. Yep, there you go. Beautiful. Okay, thank you. Megan had a question. Yes, um, it's more around the um, part of the processing that I try to figure out actually uh, with orbital data. So we normally use uh, precise orbit for uh, pre-processing of SAR data. Um, I, I read a different sources for this, but I don't quite understand, mainly in ICE, where we actually update the metadata of the SAR based on the precise orbit. Do we actually require that precise orbit similar to other softwares or not? Thank you. Yeah, yes, the ICE does require precise orbits um, for the processing. It's a little bit uh, hidden by the way the Strip Map app works. the The orbit information is read in, but it's not actually saved into the XML files. It's kind of um, 
it's yeah. in the uh, in the pickle files, but the pickle files aren't readable. So it's it's being used, but it's not uh, it's not so obvious where it, where it's being stored. It's it's being used in the topo step. So it's the input uh, file for the geo to RDR to kind of get the azimuth sensing time and range uh, for each of the pixels. So that's typically what step two, Eric, right? I don't know about the yes. strip map. Yeah. So is it, is it a good assumption to say that it's not just being used in one step, but uh, in multiple preparation, like different uh, ancillary files that goes into the strip map scripts is that correct assumption because yes i couldn't find where exactly this metadata being updated yeah it's it's kind of hidden the way ice works so <laughs> you you specify for the alas data you have to specify that leader file that has the orbit data so when you first load that uh the raw data it reads the orbit information and it it saves it in internal python structure um, but it doesn't actually write out that structure uh, hmm. except in the pickle file. If you look at the uh, the very last cells in the um, in the notebook, it shows how you can use uh, Python uh, modules of ice to actually do things with the orbit files. The orbit data that's built into the uh, uh, the ice uh, objects, Python hmm. objects, but, it's a little bit um it's a little bit hidden how it's being used so the main place it's used is for that top off step that uh, get marine mentioned that yep. sets up the geometry of the of the reference scene but then it uses it again for the this the next step where it actually determines how what the orbit the relative orbit of the two of the secondary scene is relative to the uh, reference scene and then generates the, those offsets from the, or, the course offsets from the orbits. And then it also has to use the orbits again when it, when you do the, um, the geocoding at the end of the processing. Thank you. And so ICE requires precise orbits? No, right? Uh, it won't. Uh, yeah, strip map app really expects to have precise orbits. If you uh, process it with imprecise orbits, it it might fail at the um, hmm. uh, at the um, at the step where it calculates the misregistration because it it uses the orbits to get the two images very close to where they're supposed to be, and then it just looks around for a very small amount of offset, um, a few pixels. And if your orbits are off enough that it's, you know, 10, 15, 100 pixels off, it, it won't find it. Yeah, for, for Sentinel-1, um, my impression is that the improvement from sort of the restituted orbits to the precise orbits is actually not that large. But yes, for all the data sets, it is. Yeah. For yeah ALOS, that, for, right. uh, the big problem was like ALOS-2, yeah. uh, because sometimes the ALOS-2 uh, products come with a very... Um, they call it decision orbits, and those are like the orbits that the, they use to <laughs> to to navigate the the spacecraft. Not the uh, you have to wait a few days for them to come out with the precise orbits, and you can still process the data with the the decision orbits, but you may have some weird ramps and and distortions. Yeah, we we talked earlier about um, the SAR focusing when when Zach had the question. Uh, in the past, for like things like RadarSat one, the orbit information was so poor that even in the SAR focusing process, you needed to do sometimes autofocus because the satellite velocity parameter was so poorly known uh, that you needed to do autofocus processing to figure out what the right so that satellite velocity is for a particular file for a particular data set. Yeah, it's the older satellites that had uh, much less yeah. accurate information. Even ERS uh, orbits can be be off, and sometimes there were some months when they, there was like a one second shift by some kind of mistake in the metadata. <laughs> and uh, ICE is not really set up to deal with that. 
sort of assumes that the orbits are, are quite good. The old software we had called Roypack was designed to deal with uh, the poor orbits of, uh, of Radar Sat 1 and JRS 1 and ERS 1. Of course, NISAR is going to have good orbits. The better. <laughs> we have a whole uh, GPS section at uh, JPL that knows them. It's going to be uh, calculating the orbits. Any more questions? Let's see if there are no more questions. We don't have to necessarily artificially prolong this? Absolutely not. I can go and lie down. Okay, should we call it? Yeah, let's uh, stop the recording and see everyone tomorrow morning. Right, early. <laughs>